Well, hello. I'm glad to see you all this afternoon. We're going into a new dynamic teaching series that a mini series um, that will really correlate and work with our um, Sunday morning teachings. And I believe will help us in those Sunday morning teachings. So let's get right on into it. We're going to talk about the secret place. In other words, we're going to talk about the discovery of the unseen. And this will be part one. And uh, it's a very powerful teaching, a very powerful understanding of what we're going to be under doing in Christ Life Center. And hopefully those of you who watch, those of you who are here, and hello Glenda, hello those who are signing in, we're glad that you're here. And those who come on in later on or watch the um, saved presentation, I welcome you. Let me remind you that I'm Dr. Rick Patterson, and this is Christ Life Center. And you can, if you wish, to help us by giving, text giving, 73256, Christ Life Center, one word that will enable you to immediately give to, uh, give to be able to bless this ministry. Now, let me talk to you about giving for a moment. We're obviously in a very difficult time as far as financially in the world and crisis that's going on. But the seeds that you plant today will determine the harvest that you have tomorrow. Even though it's a difficult time, giving is a part of our Christian response. Let's get into the secret place. Very interesting topic. The Bible says, Psalms chapter 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. David wrote about understanding that there was a place in a conscious awareness with God in which you can dwell in a secret place. And by the way, those of you that are coming on board, uh, let me just challenge you. Do a watch party. Share this um, link with other people in your messenger and uh, get right with it, okay? So let's talk about the secret place. David knew about it. David understood it. In the secret place of the Most High, we can bide under the shadow of the Almighty. <clears throat> now, Let's talk about the difference between religious versus spiritual. Religious versus spiritual. Most of what American churches have done has not developed a generation of believers that overcome, rather believers who have become consumers. The scripture says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives even unto death. Think about that for a moment. They that overcome, the overcomers that they said, overcame by the blood of the Lamb, number one, by the word of their testimony, number two, and number three, they loved not their life even unto death. Think about as this crisis is going on and people that you know, people maybe in your own experience. Are you at a point in your spiritual walk where you are able to, if need be, give your life for the kingdom of God? Willingly, or would you rather try to do something different? What we've developed in the kingdom of the Western Christianity is we developed a consumer Christianity, a Christianity based upon need for per or perceived needs. See, leadership will look at well, there's a need in the church. There's single mothers. There's there's a need in the church for this this. And we become a need or a perceived need based ministry. We find a need. Then we try to create a ministry to solve that need. That is totally opposite of what we find in scripture. In fact, if you think about needs, God does not respond to the most needy situations. If that were the case, the third world and everybody would be involved in all kinds of needs. But, uh, People choose their church based upon a lot of things. Proximity, parking, their facilities, social media profile, the web page, the tweets, how many tweets they've got out, 
community status, Yelp, all of these programs and all of these things, the programs for the children, singles, the married, the seniors, the homeless, and of course, not least, but maybe even most important, the music. How hot is that band? Boy, it's, is it cooking hot? Is it, how, are the singers outstanding? The choirs, the staging, the lights, the smoke, the graphic interfaces. Churches have become basic entertainment centers rather than what the New Testament talked about as far as a body of believers who've come out from among them. We become a Christian nightclub. My question for you, does this sound like the first century church? I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Now, let's look, and I hope this will bless you. Has your worship become boring and uninspired? Doesn't feel as fresh and exciting as it used to, does it? And you know it's good for you, but you wish it weren't so bland, right? Well, cheer up, kiddo. I've got great news. Holy Bunches of Worship cereal is the answer to all your worship woes. Holy Bunches of Worship is quick, guaranteed to make you feel warm and tingly, and there's no strings attached. You worship when you want, at your convenience. It's worship made easy. Finally, a way to worship that fills you up, but lets you get on with your day. One serving of Holy Bunches of Worship cereal has been scientifically proven to fill your worship quota for the entire day, and in some cases, an entire week. Non-stop worship might have been okay back in biblical days, but that's because they didn't have real jobs. The 21st century woman has a lot on her plate, and she needs to be able to squeeze worship in when and where she can. Everyone loves the deliciously divine taste of Holy Bunches of Worship cereal. Even cranky old Moses couldn't resist these bunches. Just grab a box and start your day the warm and tingly way. Holy Bunches of Worship cereal. Because it is all about you. I hope, clearly I hope, that the pandemic crisis has hopefully changed the way we see the church. This current world crisis has hopefully awakened Christians and leadership to the realities that most of what the church does is not needed. You see all the church programs, single ministry, youth ministry, Sunday school, carnivals, rummage sale, car washes, etc. All of those things, all of those things that churches have been involved with over the years. And uh, once again, welcome everybody. Glad, glad you're with us today. Um, it, I, from my point of view, it looks like my, my face is frozen, but that's, I'm continuing on. Hopefully you can hear me. Churches have literally worn out the saints of the Most High. And now people are realizing through this crisis, there's more to Christianity than just another program, another retreat, and another ministry. Yes, churches have created much of what has done to centralize the power of control and, of course, the offerings. Maybe we finally are ready to return to the secret place. Hopefully, we're making that transition. And if you're here today, I hope that that transition is going to be a reality in your life. This is going to be a great teaching today. Now, We have literally, Daniel talks about, they wore out the saints of the Most High. When we look at the current world crisis, Christians moving, uh, having to stay at their home and their families, maybe we're awakening to the fact that those programs which we are designed and have designed to control all of your nights and all of your weekends have proven not to be really what the church is all about. Now, I hope that's happening right now. Did all of the endless meetings and conferences create a generation of believers that had the capacity to change the world for Christ? 
Did we create a generation of believers who love not their life unto death that they overcame by the word of the uh, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony? Does this generation of believers have a testimony that indeed is a world-changing testimony? And have we literally exhausted everyone to the point their lives are unchanged and we sit back and we ask the question, is this all there is? And are you tired of going to meetings, services, conferences, retreat, only to find that your life really, really hasn't changed? I hope this pandemic and this crisis awakens the church. Now, has your Christian experience become all about going to the next meeting, going to the next conference, going to the next conference, going to the next comedy hour? And in this world, we seem to be striving for something. We seem to be striving in Christianity, whether it's for health, money, happiness, beauty, spirituality. And it's like we're all grasping for that ethereal straw, trying to desperately attain what we perceive we lack. And most of my 40 years of experience as pastor, I dedicated most of my time and energy to create religious people and not real spiritual mature Christians who've accessed the power, and the life of Christ within them. And I take responsibility for that. I preached against sin and challenged people to change their behaviors and to become more holy, only to find out that the more you preach against sin, the more people struggle with sin. They become sin conscious rather than Christ conscious, only to realize that we were trying to obtain change based upon the 3D physical works of the flesh and not after the spirit. But then a mega shift took place in my life. A mega shift occurred and I began to struggle in my own life and my own ministry with one crisis after another crisis, the church reaching to a point where I was to the point I didn't even really want to be on this planet any longer. I finally realized that although that there was nothing wrong with church programs per se and activities, none of these activities would increase my awareness or increase my access to the Zoe or the life of Christ within me. I'd become totally frustrated and I was totally ready to chuck the whole thing. It didn't matter. I was ready to give up the ministry. I was ready to give up on everything because I had come to that threshold. I had hit that proverbial wall spiritually. I had physically worn myself out, physically worn my family out, physically worn out members of our congregation. And then a shift took place. That mega shift when our church moved away from root programs, activities, and we discovered a place within ourselves that contained peace, safety, prosperity, and joy. And my teachings began to shift from helping people to become more religious to helping them to discover the dynamic spirituality already present within them through the Christ life. This mega shift now takes the approach that, to Christianity much different than Western Christian entertainment centers to that living the life of Christ awareness, Christ consciousness, Leaning and learning to live the life and the life of Christ here in the present, in the now. That was a mega shift for me. That was a transition that I'm telling you, I will never go back to the other system. I remember, I'm going to tell you very specifically when this shift took place. I had uh, been going through various problems. And of course, those of you who know a little bit of my history, I... Uh, through all these crises and church division and church split and uh, all of the betrayal. And I'm not going to go into all that nonsense. But I began a journey. I began a journey and I went around the world literally trying to find answers, trying to find out what was going on and why I had reached this point after been serving Christ and preaching and doing everything I thought was right. But one day, I was sitting with two of my friends in Kansas City, Missouri. We went to the Prophets Conference, that conference that was known about in Kansas City. And we actually were sitting in the front row. Now, I like to sit in the front row when I go to a meeting or very close to so that, you know, I can be more present. 
not seeing the distractions around me and other people. And as I be, sit there with my two friends, the prophet, so-called prophet, I don't know if it was P-R-O-P-H-E-P, or if he was there for P-R-O-F-I-T. I don't know. I'm not going to judge it. But all of a sudden, he began to get into his teaching and preaching, and he began to link a miracle and a prayer line and a, a moment in which he was going to pray for people. And it was going to be based upon the amount of offering that they had the capacity to give. You had a $1,000 offering, a $100 offering, a $25. And they, they, all of a sudden, I, 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 I stopped. I looked at my friends and I said, I'm leaving. I can't do this anymore. I cannot sit into another charismatic meeting in which all of a sudden the supernatural was linked to them giving a dollar at that moment. Now, let me say something to you very important. Giving is essential part of your Christian experience, and it is essential part of your spiritual growth. But it is not a spiritual condition linked to your giving that allows you to participate in the miraculous, okay? Now, I know the woman with the widow Mike, she gave more than all the others, and it was, it was noted and so forth. There is a point in which giving is critical. It's critical for your maturity and your growth, the tithe and the offering. But at this particular moment, I realized that I was sitting and I was watching what I'd seen a thousand times before, and I said, I can't do this anymore. And that was the last I'm telling you, that was the last charismatic prophetic conference I ever have gone to. That was back in 2000, I'm thinking 2002, somewhere around there. A mega shift happened, and I realized I would not be a part of that any longer. That mega shift, okay, and of course, this crisis is causing a shift on a macro level within society today. I mean, we see our economy, we see all of the, you know... I was driving this morning, and I was going, uh, driving around, wasn't going into any business in particular, but I was driving from shopping center to shopping center, from commercial areas to commercial areas, and I was noticing all of the businesses that were closing, and they were no longer opening up, literally dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens. And as we are in this mega shift, people are not able to really go to church and, and participate the way we did prior to. And in many circumstances, that's a good thing. People are becoming less interested in religious activity for its own sake and more interested in spirituality, the Christ life. The world's not impressed by our Christian music programs, our activities that fail to offer inner peace and freedom. Now, I like music as well as anybody. And over the years, we've had some of the major singers and the best concerts and the best musicians and singers and performers in Christian. But a relative Christianity is one that has shifted from the hype and the glitz of contemporary Christianity to the return to the true biblical expression of living the life of Christ. Now, awakening has begun. Christian spirituality does not require you to perform certain steps in order to attain another higher level of a spiritual ranking. Seven steps to this, seven steps to that, seven steps to maturity, seven steps into that. I remember I was on a time when I was in Sedona, Arizona. I sat down in a chair in a bookstore. And I went into a trance, I went into a vision, and I saw this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful mountain in this vision. And in this mountain, there was a road, a white, beautiful road that led to the top of it. And as I approached in this vision, I approached this road. The closer I got to it, I realized that this was a solid, marble, highly polished road. No steps. In fact, 
I would try to step on it and I would slide down. I would try to step higher and slide down. And every time I would try to step on this, I would slide backwards. And I, in this trance, in this vision, I said, God, how do you expect me to get to the top? There are no steps. And God spoke to me very clearly. He says, there are no steps. You are already there. In that split instant, something changed inside me. I realized that I'm not trying to find another step. I'm already at the top. At the core of Christianity and Christian spirituality, there's the understanding that everything you need for spirituality is already present within you. There's nothing missing. You no longer need to strive to become more spiritual because you have direct access to the power and the life of Christ within you. The, in this awakening, in this awakened state, in this moment of personal enlightenment and hopefully your enlightenment, we have the ability to live God's power and God's life. In this place, we learn the life or the Christ life. And all the great teachers and prophets of the past knew how to access that peace within themselves. This knowledge empowered them to become great teachers, great philosophers, great men and women of God. I, I, I think about Mother Teresa. Not a bunch of glitz, not a bunch of glamour, but became one of the most significant spiritual leaders in the 20th century. When you begin to learn to access that place within you, that secret place, you will discover the power to transform your emotions and the world around us. Now, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, you can learn to access this place of endless possibilities. Psalms 91. Clearly, this is what the scripture was talking about. Are you open? Ask yourself the question. Are you open to the possibilities of a new, authentic experience with Jesus Christ? Are you ready for something different? Are you ready to go where most Christians in this generation have not gone? And that's to that secret place. So join me in a journey of enlightenment. This is part one, and I hope you enjoyed it. You can send me your questions and email to me, or if you want to, you can send them here online. And uh, let me remind you, you can give by texting 73256 Christ Life Center, one word. So with that today, I want to challenge you and join me again on the next time.